In this final sequence, I will address the thematic elements of the novella. This little book tells a tightly wrought narrative, and it invites a great deal of comment. In particular, I take the final page of this novella to be very important, and my ultimate aim in these comments is to reveal why that is. In general, we have been traveling for seventeen chapters in the mind of Alexei Ivanovich Velchaninov, and now, at long last, we can take our leave of it and evaluate things from a more objective, third-person perspective. What shall we say of this man? What shall we say of his antagonist, whose mind we never enter? And how shall we understand the events that bind them? Suppose we begin with that last element. Now that the dust is settled, we can recap the plot sequence with a clear view. Here it is. Nine years in the past, a relatively young libertine of an aristocrat added to a lengthy record of amorous adventures yet one more item. A torrid love affair with the wife of his friend at the provincial town of T. The affair produces a pregnancy, which in part prompts the young wife to urge the disbelieving Velchaninov to depart. The other cause of his dismissal is likely a new romantic rival and the young military officer. The wife considers confirming for the departed Velchaninov of the fact that he really does have a child, but decides against it, sending instead a letter that omits that particular detail. Later she has a more extended affair with another aristocrat named Bagautov, who also stays at tea for some years. Later she dies prematurely of consumption, and before she can destroy any of the evidence about her prior adultery. Pavel Pavlovich stumbles upon a stack of letters from Bagautov and a single unsent letter from his wife, learns conclusively that her wife has had these two lovers, infers that there were probably more, we know he suspects the officer, and discovers that Lisa is not his biological daughter, but Velchaninov's. This is the backstory. Pavel Pavlovich, having suddenly developed a nasty drinking habit, takes his daughter with him on a trip to Petersburg, ostensibly to secure a better post in the Russian civil service, but clearly with an aim to visit these ghosts from his past. Bagautov, and perhaps especially Velchaninov. The latter, now middle-aged and embroiled in a lawsuit, is also suffering from something like a midlife crisis, haunted by memories of his past, and so Pavel Pavlovich's arrival comes at a sensitive time for him. In his interaction with Pavel Pavlovich, he discovers that he has a daughter, and that she is being treated terribly by her presumed father. Alarmed, he attempts to rescue Lisa from the alcoholic by having her stay at the wholesome Pogoryeltsev household, but the shock is too much for her, and she dies from consumption shortly thereafter. After hearing the news, Pavel Pavlovich sobers up and attempts to create a new life for himself by remarrying, using his wealth and status to gain access to the young and attractive Nadia Zalabinin. But his gestures there are crude and awkward, and sharply unwelcome to the girl, who was enamored instead of the young radical Lobov. At any rate, Pavel Pavlovich is repeatedly discomfited, first by the girls at the Zalabinins, then by Velchaninov at the piano, and finally by Lobov himself. Throughout these events, Velchaninov and Pavel Pavlovich have multiple interactions, which in my view are dominated by four nocturnal interviews at Velchaninov's flat, with increasing intensity over time. The first, told in chapters 2 and 3, begins with Velchaninov's first nightmare. <laughs> 
The second, in chapter 7, is laced with sinister insinuations with respect to the now deceased Bagautov. In the third, in chapter 9, the insinuations become murderously malevolent, as Pavel Pavlovich regales Velchaninov with an anecdote of vengeance, and the event is capped off with Velchaninov's fright over an apparition. In the final interview, told in chapters 13 through 15, the prior insinuations finally become concrete with the attempted murder. When that attempt is thwarted, Pavel Pavlovich ultimately abandons his intentions towards the Zalabinin girl and leaves Petersburg. Instead, he finds his second bride in the provinces. Again, he marries a younger woman for her beauty, and yet again he finds himself in the role of an eternal husband. That is, a merely legal appendage to a woman who satisfies her romantic interests elsewhere, such as with the young drunken Ulan who is following her about. For his part, two years after the events in Petersburg, Velchaninov has cast off his former hypochondria and, having won his lawsuit, is prepared to resume his womanizing lifestyle with the comfort of lifelong financial security. He is briefly disturbed by his chance visit with Pavel Pavlovich, but his disquiet does not last long. His last regret is simply that his momentary distemper precluded his taking advantage of an opportunity for a dalliance with a provincial female acquaintance. These are the events of the novella. But how are we to understand them? The natural place to begin is with Velchaninov's own analysis, as it appears in Chapter 16. That analysis is incomplete, but I think that it is mostly correct. Pavel Pavlovich did not come to Petersburg with the intention of murdering Velchaninov. Perhaps he did hate Velchaninov, and there seems to be a little question that he toys with him throughout much of the narrative. But even with his knowledge of Velchaninov's betrayal, he still loved, even idolized the man. Indeed, he shifts from predatory to peaceable and back again in the same sequence with dizzying quickness. For instance, in the nighttime interviews of chapters 7 and 9. So, in one moment, he is taunting Velchaninov with his tale about the deceased Bagautov, his every word dripping with menace. And in the next moment, he is asking to kiss his host, and not as a taunt, but with sincere affection. These dual motives might have been operative in his including Velchaninov in the Zalabinin affair. From the predatory motive to show off his new bride to his opponent, as Velchaninov accuses him of doing in Chapter 13, and from the peaceable one to secure his idol's approval, as Velchaninov suspects in Chapter 16. Surely both motives are at work in that climactic scene. On the one hand, Pavel Pavlovich is desperate to save Velchaninov from his liver attack and goes to extraordinary lengths to nurse him back to health. On the other hand, he attempts to seize his one opportunity to murder the man in his sleep and this in the span of a couple of hours. I think Velchaninov goes too far when he claims that, after Liza's death, Pavel Pavlovich stayed away from him for a month in order to spare him. The man's murderous instincts do not seem so overwhelming that he would have to keep at a distance to suppress them. Surely he had another motive, to seek out a new life. But Velchaninov is surely right when he says that Pavel Pavlovich is the sort of man who, once he gets started down a certain path, would develop a bloodlust and cut the head clean off. <laughs>
This is precisely the sort of thing that Dostoevsky observed in the Siberian prison camp, as he tells us in The House of the Dead. The delicate souls have the capacity to be the most sadistic if given the right kind of push. As Velchaninov puts it in his analysis, quote, The most monstrous monster is the monster with noble feelings. Unquote. So far, our protagonist's view of things is mostly right. But it is also limited, and much of the story is told by the network of ideas from which he instinctively recoils, what his mind rarely consciously entertains. In fact, part of the genius of the present work is that it inverts the perspective that we are accustomed to take, especially with the early Dostoevsky. As the rich, womanizing aristocrat and a predatory plaintiff in a lawsuit, Velchaninov is in the role that we usually expect to be played by the villain. For instance, Prince Velkovsky from The Insulted and Injured. It is his antagonist who is the one who was insulted and injured in this case. Pavel Pavlovich is the one who seems to have the most in common with the hapless or unstable heroes, or anti-heroes, of Dostoevsky's early works. Makar from Poor Folk, Golyadkin from The Double, or indeed the famous underground man. In fact, as noted in my introduction, Dostoevsky originally expected to write this story from Pavel Pavlovich's perspective, but eventually chose to switch it around. There are other early sources of inspiration here, too. The motif of an older man marrying a young girl is as old as Dostoevsky's written work, but it comes up in two of the short stories of the 1840s, what Joseph Frank calls the Petersburg Grotesques. A Christmas tree and a wedding presents this image in a mournful way, as a kind of exploitation. But in Another Man's Wife or the Husband Under the Bed, we see its comic aftermath. The older husband is chronically cuckolded and unable to catch his wife in the act. This theme is echoed by Pavel Pavlovich always trying to find a lover under the bed in the last chapter of the current work. But the closest parallel from these early works is surely the double. In that earlier novella, the protagonist's life is railroaded by an impish figure who suddenly appears in Petersburg and usurps all his projects and ambitions. Certain aspects of The Eternal Husband have this distinct flavor. Pavel Pavlovich suddenly arrives in Petersburg and haunts Velchaninov, often popping up unexpectedly, at his flat or in the streets of Petersburg, and torturing him with hints and veiled threats. But the eternal husband is more complicated and more realistic than the double, and much can be said about how these two figures are doubles of each other. The most striking visual image of the doubling comes in the last scene of chapter 16, as Velchaninov catches his paling face in the looking-glass while holding the decade-old letter from Natalia Vasilyevna, and imagines how Pavel Pavlovich himself must have looked a couple of months prior. In fact, the letter itself shows an important connection between them. Although we are likely to think of Pavel Pavlovich as the greater victim from past events, there is a sense in which Velchaninov is doubly rejected by the contents of that letter. On the one hand, he is being thrown over by Natalia Vasilyevna for another man, much as Pavel Pavlovich had been thrown over for him. But on the other hand, the letter presents another deeper rejection. His former lover opted not to send him the details of her pregnancy, nor to send him that invitation to visit. 
That is, she rejected him as a father. She chose Pavel Pavlovich as a father over him. It is worth remembering one of the details from Velchenina's reminiscences, in chapter 4, of his stay in T. However spectacularly unfaithful she may have been in all things erotic, in most everything else, Natalia Vasilyevna was loyal to her husband. She would defend him against any public slight, for instance, would never laugh at him or insult him, and would even protect him against Velchaninov's inquiries, and would certainly never abandon him. In most things she preferred Pavel Pavlovich to Velchaninov, including, we discover, the arena of child-rearing. This fact requires us to re-evaluate our two principal characters with respect to their role as fathers. We are so struck by the outrageous evils of Pavel Pavlovich toward Liza that we naturally become sympathetic with Velchaninov's case. How can we not despise the man who pinches, neglects, and verbally torments a young girl while chasing after prostitutes in a drunken stupor? How can we not side with Velchaninov when he rushes to rescue the girl and place her in a healthy environment, such as the one at the Pogoyeltsev household? But however naturally we might side with Velchaninov on this issue, Liza clearly does not. She immediately labels Velchaninov as a wicked man as he takes her away from Pavel Pavlovich. And while she is lying in bed with a fever, her desperate plea is that Velchaninov would take her away from her new environs, presumably back to the man she had always known as her father. The text hints that Lisa suspects much of what is going on behind the scenes, and can interpret the cause of her father's drinking and the identity of the stranger who takes her away which would give her even more reason to dislike Velchaninov. The fact that she becomes seriously sick only when she arrives at her new home confirms Klavdia Petrovna's diagnosis, that she is ashamed at having been given up so easily by Pavel Pavlovich into Velchaninov's care. Liza, like her mother, chooses Pavel Pavlovich over Velchaninov as a father. Some reflection will suggest some reasons for why that might be. Although we never get to witness it, we have every reason to believe that Pavel Pavlovich was an excellent father for nine years. We should probably believe the man when he says in Chapter 5 that he had always considered Lisa to be a blessing from God, a delight to the family after so many childless years. In that same chapter, we hear that Lisa pines after older days when he had shown her so much more affection. For the vast majority of her life, Lisa knew Pavel Pavlovich as a good father. On this score, it is also worth observing when it is that Pavel Pavlovich is drunk, and when he isn't. He was mostly sober during the family days of his past. He becomes a drunkard after he discovers his wife's secrets and the truth of Lisa's parentage. He sobers up only after he hears of Lisa's death and is free to set out on a new life symbolically depicted by his ripping the crepe off his hat on his way to the Zalabinins. Later, the shock of the climactic night, the reopening of his wounds about Liza, the mortal struggle with Velchaninov, all that sends the man right back to drink, and the last image of him before his departure from Petersburg, as related by Lobov, is his drunkenly throwing money to beggars in honor of the soul of Lizaveta. Pavel Pavlovich behaves like a monster, 
and yet it appears that he does so precisely because of his deep attachment to Lisa. On the flip side, we have Velchaninov. In what way does our protagonist love his daughter? The title of chapter 6 is deliberate and pointed. Lisa is the new fancy of an idle man. Of course, he does all the socially acceptable things. He feels the right kinds of emotions in reaction to the tragedy. Rage at the man who seems to have hastened her death. Sleepless agitation at her bedside. Mourning at the loss of the girl, and so on. But the description of his thought process in the cemetery in chapter 10 is suggestive. He entertains noble, conscious thoughts, the desire that he could have loved Lisa the rest of his days, the idea that he could have his former sins expiated by that love, and so on. But there is a thought that he quickly suppresses. He wonders whether it's credible that a man like Pavel Pavlovich could possibly have a deep love for the girl, but, quote, he made haste to dismiss that question and, as it were, brush it aside. There was something awful in that question, something he could not bear and could not solve. Unquote. But perhaps we can solve it. Velchaninov's love for Lisa appears to be a forgery. Indeed, it seems to be mostly a tool to entertain or to console himself in order to make up for the sordidness of his own past. The title of chapter 13 asks the question, On whose side most? That is, on which side of Lisa's grave is there the greatest grief? Pavel Pavlovich insists that there is more on his side. The evidence suggests that he is right for it is Pavel Pavlovich who never stops mourning, even years after the fact. First-time readers of The Eternal Husband often come away with a sense of discomfort, since something as tragic as the death of a child simply drops out of the narrative for such lengthy stretches, as though with callous indifference. But the discomfort appears to be deliberately contrived, for it signals that Lisa drops out of Velchaninov's mind for lengthy stretches. There is simply less on his side. Lisa is the helpless victim of these two men in the current work. Curiously, Lisa is also the name of the helpless victim of another of Dostoevsky's mature novellas, which is, of course, Notes from Underground. The expression underground first pops up in Chapter 9, in a moment where Velchaninov, under the pressure of Pavel Pavlovich's hints, explodes with the accusation of underground vileness. But by the time Chapter 13 comes around, during that final nocturnal interview, Velchaninov uses the adjective to apply to himself as well, claiming that they were both vicious, underground, loathsome people. Presumably, this is the same sentiment that gets its final expression in Chapter 16, when, during his analysis, Velchaninov calls Pavel Pavlovich a quasimodo, or ill-formed monster. Again, his criticism there extends to himself. Quote, the most monstrous monster is the monster with noble feelings. I know that by personal experience, Pavel Pavlovich. Unquote. And later, quote, even decent people have to pay for embraces and tears of forgiveness nowadays, to say nothing of men like you and me, Pavel Pavlovich. Unquote. This leads to the question of what exactly it means to be an underground, loathsome person. 
When he uses that expression as a term of abuse in chapters 9 and 13, Velchaninov is describing a person who excessively ruminates on old injuries, holding grudges, considering various forms of vengeance while nursing a warped and bloated amor propre. This profile does match the famous underground man from that prior novella, who famously rails against the laws of nature and of society in a kind of perverse rebellion. But we often forget another feature of the underground man, especially as he appears in part two of Notes. The man is a disaffected romantic. That is, he grew up with high ideals about the good and the beautiful, with the ego to match, but without being able to bring reality into correspondence with them. This is the origin of his bitterness. There is no question that Pavel Pavlovich has those high ideals. That he, like the underground man, is a weak man with a romantic spirit. That is what he repeatedly confesses in those interactions in Velchaninov's flat, identifying Velchaninov himself as his inspiration. That explains the depth of his injury from Velchaninov and the teetering between love and hate that we see throughout. But what of Velchaninov? He must have had some notion of high ideals years ago, as he served as such an inspiration for his double. But Velchaninov's goal very clearly is to kill these sentiments. Chapter 16 is particularly illustrative here. During his analysis, he derisively calls Pavel Pavlovich a Schiller who wants to embrace and weep and forgive. That is, a man in the romantic mold, despite being a deformed Quasimodo in outward appearance. The following day, he is mortified by the idea that he, too, should be animated by a desire to embrace and shed tears, and makes up a separate excuse to explain why he is heading in the direction of Pavel Pavlovich's flat. But within an hour, he is in conversation with Lobov, and during that discussion he hurls a taunt at Lobov, that he and Pavel Pavlovich are Schilleresque poets. For Velchaninov, the term Schiller is an epithet, a term of abuse, despite his deep-seated fear that he has the Schilleresque instinct himself. Again, consider the shame he experiences over his past love affair with Natalia Vasilyevna, as revealed in Chapter 6. The shame is not over sleeping with a friend's wife. It is over the idea that he, a man of the world, could have been so taken by this provincial lady. A man of his position should be able to love and leave a woman, especially one who was not particularly beautiful. And yet he was besotted, and later ashamed of that very fact. Indeed, the whole novella starts out with this conflict in his mind. In chapter one, we discover that the man feels as though he is being attacked by what he calls higher ideas. Ideas, that is, that he cannot honestly laugh at in his heart, despite the fact that he would scoff at them in the company of others. In the evening he suffers from them, in the morning he is ashamed of them, and at all times he wants to be free of them. Some of these ideas are attacks of conscience, memories from his past. These memories get their clearest expression in his subconscious mind, that is, in his recurring dream. Velchaninov suffers from three separate night terrors in the story, one of which was Pavel Pavlovich playing the role of the apparition in Chapter 9. But the opening and closing terrors are the dreams of Chapters 2 and 15, and 
mostly identical but with small variations. In each case, strangers crowd into the flat who stand as though accusing him of some unspecified crime. In each case, the principal accuser is a mute figure who sits at the table. In each case, the strangers suddenly turn to the door in expectation, and each dream is capped off with three rings at the bell. There are two differences between them worth noting here. In the second dream, the crowd's fury reaches a shriller pitch as they shout, they are bringing it with expectation. Presumably this is the instrument of some highly anticipated justice, and perhaps it corresponds to the razor blade Pavel Pavlovich might have been picking up at that moment. But critically, the identity of the mute figure at the table appears to have shifted, and further he now has black crepe on his hat. Who is this figure? In the first dream, surrounding events seem clearly to point to Pavel Pavlovich. There the figure is described as some close friend from his past that Velcheninov could not recognize a man with unknown charges to press against the dreamer. A few moments later, Pavel Pavlovich, a man matching that description, appears on Velchaninov's doorstep. In the second dream, the figure has crepe on his hat, which might seem again to point to Pavel Pavlovich, since that was originally the distinguishing feature of his attire. But by chapter 15, Pavel Pavlovich is no longer wearing crepe. He threw his crepe into the street on his way to the Zalabinins. Further, the dreamer himself is convinced that the person is a different man. Who is this man, and what is the nature of his accusation? The motif of the ringing bells provides the clue. To my memory, there are two occasions in the waking moments of the plot where bells ring. The first occurs at the tail end of chapter 13, when our two main characters are engaged in a heated discussion about the grave that lies between them. At that moment, Lobov interrupts them with a violent ring at the door. The second is even more pointed. On the platform, just before these men have their final separation, the bell announcing the train's departure rings for the third time, just as in that dream. That is when Pavel Pavlovich finally delivers the judgment that has been awaiting its moment since the beginning. Refusing to take Velchaninov's hand, he tearfully asks, and Elisa. The silent accusation was never about Natalia Vasilyevna and Velchaninov's womanizing. It was about the very real victim of Velchaninov's behavior, the innocent girl. The text is ambiguous, but we might suspect that Velchaninov is the girl's real killer not just in the indirect sense of causing his opponent's drunken abuse via his decade-old indiscretion, but in a more direct way, by removing the girl from the father she had always known. And who is the silent accuser in that second dream with a crepe on his hat? And for whom is he mourning? My own guess is that it is Velchaninov himself, or a part of him, and that he is mourning for his daughter. Or perhaps he has more to weep over than just Lisa, and it is worth comparing how the story begins with how it ends. As Chapter 1 reveals, Velchaninov has many victims. Indeed, Lisa is not his only child. 
At one point he seduced an impoverished girl to whom he was not even attracted, impregnated her, and abandoned both lover and child. He once slandered a schoolmaster's wife in a way that might have destroyed the lives of an innocent couple. He once abused an old clerk in an office who was defending the honor of his daughter, reducing him to tears. He once shot off the leg of a rival aristocrat who had insulted him, reducing him to crutches. And this, the text tells us, is only a sample of such events of his past. With the recurrence of these memories in Chapter 1, Velchaninov appears to be haunted by two things. First, by his conscience, and second, by the embarrassing fact that a man like him, a man of the world, should be burdened by a conscience at all. In Chapter 16, the man has no conscience. He is once again a man of the world, and even Lisa has been very conveniently forgotten altogether. That is, until that judgment comes from the lips of Pavel Pavlovich. But the last lines of the novella are very important. The silent accuser of his dream is dead and gone. Velchaninov misses that trip to pay his amorous addresses to a female target, and that's the only kind of thing he is capable of regretting afterwards. The real conflict of the novella is not between the man and his human opponent. It is a man's battle against his own conscience, his own ideals. The man wins. But perhaps that is not the kind of victory worth celebrating. Pavel Pavlovich, monster that he is, runs onto that train the better man, for at least he is still a Schilleresque poet underneath. At any rate, that is how I read this narrative. These comments may, of course, be woefully inaccurate or incomplete. And if you find them to be so, I welcome you to improve upon them in the comments section below. As for this channel, after a bit of a break, I expect to tackle a trio of short stories from the 1870s, beginning with a curious piece called Bobok. My next lengthier project is likely to be The Adolescent, or A Raw Youth. But the current project is at an end. I thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the experience.